Praise the Lord. It's Brother Clinton. I'm back. I'm here to continue with you in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's the fifth day of the week, the uh, 22nd of December, the year of our Lord, 2016, 5777. In the previous video, I made it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. And I decided to stop at that point and continue in a new video because there are some of you who don't really want to watch a video for two hours. Okay, and or an hour and a half or two hours or whatever. And I don't want to cut the Word of God short. I don't want to cut the teaching of the Word of God short. And so I just kind of cut this first chapter into at least two parts for right now. But as, as far as I know, it's going to be in two parts. Um, and so I hope this is a blessing to you. Those of you who, who truly desire the Word of God, I know that you're going to click on this second video and continue in this teaching as well. So assuming that you have heard the the portion uh, of this teaching that I just got done doing in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. I'm going to continue, not backtracking, but continue in verse 10. So blessed be the name of the Lord. The reason that Paul spoke all the things that he spoke, or at least part of the reason that he spoke all the things that he spoke in verses 1 through 9, is to kind of set the stage, if you will. No, that's not really a good analogy, set the stage, but to set a foundation for the things that he is about to speak in the next several chapters because what we're about to start reading in verse 10 is a conversation that Paul's going to continue with and, and, and he's going to address it from several different angles for the next three or four chapters of this letter. So it's very important that we pay attention and understand exactly what Paul is referring to here and the reason that he's writing these things. It's very, very important. So let's continue. 1 Corinthians 1.10 Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. All right. Now, that ye all speak the same thing. Now, Paul says, I beseech you. Paul was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a man who was called by God to preach the word of God, and he had the authority from God to bless and to curse and to preach the truth of the gospel. He had the authority from God to, to either preach the gospel to you so you could enter in the kingdom of God or withhold it from you so that you couldn't. All right? He is a man of great authority. And he says, now I beseech you. I beseech you. In other words, like he said in 1 Thessalonians, he, he treated them like a, like a nurse mother would treat her children. Okay? Or those that she's caring for. With gentleness. Even though he had the authority to say, I command you. Yet he said, I beseech you, I beseech you. Because what happens if you have a teenager and that teenager wants to do something you don't want him to do and you command him not to do it? What's the first thing that he's going to do when you turn your back? He's going to do what you told him not to do. But Paul says, I beseech you, I beseech you, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you, I implore you because this is so very important. You all don't even understand the importance of what I am beseeching you, but I beseech you. Brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, by what greater thing can Paul beseech anyone but by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ? Even as it's written in Hebrews, for God, knowing that he could swear by no greater, swear by himself. Right? Well, Paul is following that same precept, saying, I beseech you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Speak the same thing. Why are there divisions in the church? Because people are carnal. Because people turn away from the Lord Jesus Christ and because they become involved and wrapped up in their own pride. Pride. Proverbs 13.10. What does it say, brothers and sisters? Proverbs 13.10. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. You see, who is a wise man among you, and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show forth his wisdom with meekness. This is written in the book of James. Let him show forth his works with meekness of wisdom. This is the man who is wise. But only by pride cometh contention. You see, if you're arguing with someone, what, whoever you are in the whole world, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what your status is in the world, it doesn't matter what you're arguing about, if you are arguing with someone, then the reason that you're arguing with that person is because of pride. Period. End of story. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you're arguing about. I don't care how, con how convinced you are that you're right and he's wrong and you need to, pardon me, and you need to, to, to make him understand. 
You see, if you're arguing with someone about anything, the reason that you're arguing with him is because of pride. That's the only reason. There is no other reason. You see, it's pride. Only by pride cometh contention. Five words that you and I need to have tattooed in our brains so that we can understand that when we're arguing with someone, it is not the will of God. It's only by pride. There's only one reason that will cause you to argue with anyone about anything. And that reason is pride. Did Jesus Christ, the Son of God, argue with people? Did he debate with people? Now, I know you'll say to me, well, Paul debated with some in the synagogue. That's not what you think a debate is. Did Jesus Christ command his people to debate and argue? Did Jesus Christ debate and argue with anyone? When they came to him and said, and they, and they said who gave thee this authority to do these things? Did he say, you know, let's schedule a debate for tomorrow at 3 o'clock in the synagogue? No, no. He said, I will also ask you a question. And if you can answer my question, then I'll answer yours. And in his wisdom, he asked them a question that he knew they wouldn't be able to answer because of their pride. And so the conversation was finished, and he went on doing the things that he was called to do. You see? Only by pride cometh contention. Five words that we need to remember. Only by pride cometh contention. Only by pride cometh contention. I'm doing this over and over because I want you to never forget it, my brethren. Only by pride cometh contention. If you're arguing with anyone about anything, the only reason that you're arguing is because of pride. When you know the truth, you have no reason to argue. You set it out there. If people receive it, great. If they want to know more, great. If they don't receive it, that's their problem. Okay? And I don't say that in a prideful way. That's their problem. I say that in, in a truthful way. That's their problem. That's between them and God. It's not between them and me. If I give somebody the truth of the Word of God, that's why the scripture says, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted, and sinneth, being condemned of himself. You see, the scripture doesn't say after the first and second admonition, if he's a heretic, argue with him or debate with him, or, or open your theology book and, and, and have, a, you know, have, a, have a debate with him. No, it says reject him. Because it's evident that he's not going to hear the word of God. Because this word isn't made... Uh, manifest to people by intellect. Your intellect has nothing to do with whether or not you can hear the Word of God. Nothing. Your intellect has as much to do with whether or not you can hear the Word of God as... Well, I was hoping I'd be able to come up with an example by the time I got to this part of the sentence, but, but you know, in, in as much as your money, however much money you have, has anything to do with the amount of peace that you have, Okay, your intellect has nothing to do with whether or not you can hear the Word of God. See, your intellect cannot bring you understanding of the Word of God, just like your money cannot buy you peace. Some of the richest people in this world have the most money in the world are committing suicide or living in misery because they have no peace, because money can't buy you peace. And your intellect cannot commend you to the Word of God. It cannot. You, if you understand the Word of God, it's not because of your intellect. And we're going to get into that as in, in, in the latter part of this chapter. And Paul will speak about that. So let's continue in verse 10. So now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. It's so important that we all speak the same thing. There are so many people all over the world. Now, listen to me. Are you paying attention? There are so many people all over the world that are raised up in their denominations. And they believe what they believe because of their denomination. You see, and they're convinced of that. And so somebody is raised up in this denomination, the Lutheran denomination in the state of Minnesota. And somebody else is raised up in the Baptist denomination in the state of Alabama. Okay? Now these people both profess to be Christians. And if someone in Minnesota asks the Lutheran a question, you know, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? That Lutheran is not going to give that man the same answer as if someone asked that Baptist in Alabama, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? They're both going to give that man, those men, two different answers. Why? Because neither one of them are Christians. You see? Because the Lutheran is not a Christian. Because the Baptist is not a Christian. They are disciples of their denominations. They're not disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's why they speak two different things. You see? Because if they were disciples of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is one. 
His word is one. It is the same. You can read it over and over and over, and it's always the same. It never changes. It is, it is immutable. And so if there's a man in Minnesota who's a disciple of Jesus Christ, and another man in Alabama who's a disciple of Jesus Christ, and two people in those states ask those men, both of those men, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? They're both going to say the same thing. Why? Because they go, but they both got it from the same place. Where did Paul get the gospel that he preached? Did he learn it from the other apostles? No. Did he go to a Bible study and the other apostles, you know, put him in his little desk with his little paper and pen and say, okay, you know, this is the gospel. And, and they had their chalkboard and, and they taught, you know, this is the uh, apostle seminary and this is where we learn to be apostles. And apostle Paul went to their, went to their seminary, to their classes and, and the other apostles, Barnabas and, 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 and Peter and Matthew, they taught Paul and he took tests every semester, you know, and he learned from the other apostles, the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, of course not. That's ridiculous. Where did Paul learn the gospel that he got? He got it from God. He got it from God, from Jesus Christ, by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he said this specifically in the letter to the Galatians. He said that he got his gospel from Jesus Christ. And that's where you and I get it from as well. You see? And so this is so very important that we all speak the same thing. If I am a Christian, I'm here in Costa Rica, and you're a Christian, and you are in Canada, okay, or you're in Australia, or you're in China, and someone comes to you and asks you a question, you ought to give them the same answer that I would give someone in my neighborhood if they asked me that same question. Why? Because we got our revelation from the same source, Jesus Christ. And if we're all serving one God, the Lord Jesus Christ, then we all should be speaking the same thing. And if we're not speaking the same thing, it's because we haven't learned what we've learned from Jesus Christ, but we've learned it from some other source. And so that's why we need to be washed with water by the word. Okay? Washed with water by the word. Not with the water of the word, because the word isn't water. But washed with water by the word. Which is to say that the same way that a dirty plate can be washed with water so that it becomes clean, so we can be washed with the word of God so that the traditions and lies that were taught to us all of our lives by Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, can be washed from us and replaced with the truth of God's word. And how does that come? Does it come by watching YouTube videos? Well, here, here I am on YouTube and I'm sharing the truth with you. And there may be others on YouTube. There are one or two that I know of also that are sharing the truth. But the vast majority of people on YouTube are not sharing the truth. Okay, so where can we all learn to speak the same thing? From YouTube? No. From theological books? No. From a seminary? No, certainly not. From going to a church? No, certainly not. Where can we get it? From Jesus Christ, boys and girls, by spending time in this word and on your knees. As I've said many times before that I got from a dear brother many years ago, a saying that he gave me, we don't need theology, we need wordology and neology. Okay, those are the only ologies we need, wordology and neology. Okay, this word and your knees. That's all you need. That's all you need. And that is what you should be pursuing. The Word of Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Spending time in the Word of God. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, saith the Scripture. And spending time on your knees in prayer. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Brother Clinton, how much time should I spend on my knees? I don't know. Spend a lot of time on your knees. Spend a lot of time on your knees. Well, how much time do you spend on your knees, Brother Clinton? Well, I'm not going to say, well, I spend, you know, three hours a day on my knees, or I spend an hour and a half a day on my knees. Well, first of all, that's none of your business. And second of all, why should I boast about how much time I spend or don't spend in prayer? It's not about how much time I spend in prayer. It's about how much time we need to spend in prayer. You see, there isn't a time limit. The scripture doesn't say, thou shalt spend 90 minutes of every four hours of the day in prayer. The scripture doesn't say that. But the scripture says, pray without ceasing. See, the scripture says, seek and ye shall find. You see, the scripture says, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So how diligently are you willing to seek God? Well, that depends on how desirous you are of the reward that God has for you. And if you will seek him with all your heart, you will find him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so in that way, we can all speak the same thing because we all get it from the same source.
I know I've spent like 15 minutes talking about this one particular thing. Speak the same thing, and it's so very important. And this lays the foundation for the next several chapters of what Paul's going to be talking about. We need to all speak the same thing. If we're not speaking the same thing, it's because we have not learned what we've learned from the same source. And that's a fact, Jack. Okay, that's the fact, Jack. If you haven't, if you're not speaking the same thing as me, then the reason for that is because one of us has not learned what we've learned from Jesus Christ. You see? So we need to seek Jesus Christ, be washed from those things that we believed were true because they were taught to us by religious denominations, but they weren't true. We need to be washed from those things so that we all speak the same thing. And that's one of the beautiful things about this letter, 1 Corinthians, is that it is so diverse in the subject matter because Paul's addressing a lot of things, a lot of different subjects in this letter that need to be addressed so that we can all speak the same thing. You see, when we read the scripture, we're reading the word of God because Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, had been in the presence of God. He was called by God. and The things that he was speaking was the word of God. And so this is how we can all speak the same thing, by learning it from the same source, which is God. Hallelujah. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Judgment. Okay. Oh, but the Bible says don't judge, Brother Clinton. No, the Bible doesn't say don't judge. The Bible says judge not, lest ye be judged. For with the same judgment that ye judge, ye shall be judged. Matthew 7, 1, it doesn't say, do not judge. It says, be careful how you judge, for you are commanded to judge, because if you don't judge, you will perish. That's the scripture, and there's a video on this channel called Judge Righteous Judgment, and if you want to know more about that, just do a Google search, the word prophet, Judge Righteous Judgment, and it'll pop right up for you. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Someone in the household of Chloe declared to Paul that there was contentions among the Corinthians in their church. Now, Paul had spent a year and a half with them, teaching them. And he left, and now he's writing letters to them. And, and he's writing this letter to them to tell them that somebody from the house of Chloe has told me that there are contentions among you. Only by pride cometh contention. Right? Only by pride cometh contention. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. What? What? Paul must have been marveling. How could I have spent a year and a half with these people, with these my brethren, and they be saying such ridiculous nonsense? How could they have fallen into such a grievous error? Is Christ divided? Verse 13, is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? No. No, Christ is one. He's not divided. His arms and his legs aren't cut off to send to different countries of the world. So one country worships his leg and another country worships his arm and another country worships his foot. Uh, no, Christ is one. Christ is not divided. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Now, what a ridiculous, redundant question. But he had to ask it because of the ridiculous manner with which they were speaking. And you might agree with me and you might say, oh yeah, yeah, Paul, what a ridiculous thing that they would say, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos. Well, do you say, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm an apostolic? Then you are doing the exact same thing. Because there are no apostolics or Pentecostals or Lutherans or Baptists in the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not divided and Jesus Christ has no churches that are called by those names. So if you belong to a church that is called by one of those names, then you do not belong to Jesus Christ. And if you belong to Jesus Christ, and you've been in one of those churches, then what is your only option? Come out. Come out of those churches that are called by other names that don't belong to Jesus Christ. And come to Jesus Christ and serve him. And speak the same thing as all the other disciples of Jesus Christ, who have come out from all those religious denominations to serve the only true and living God and wait for his Son from heaven, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And you might say, well, these are pretty ridiculous questions. 
Yes, they are. And it's kind of ridiculous questions like this that you have to ask foolish children who don't understand righteousness and truth in so much as they are saying such ridiculous things. I'm a Paul. I'm, a, I'm of Apollos. Oh, I'm a Catholic. Oh, I'm a Lutheran. Oh, I'm a Baptist. Oh, I'm a Presbyterian. Oh, I'm an Apostolic. Oh, I'm a Pentecostal. You are lost. You are carnal. What does carnal mean? Is there a such thing as a carnal Christian? Well, Paul's going to talk about this in a little bit. You cannot be carnal and Christian at the same time. Carnal, if you're carnal, to be carnally minded is death. Paul said this, to be carnally minded is death. Can you be a Christian and have and, and be carnally minded unto death? Is that what a Christian is all about? Being minded unto death? No, being a Christian is being spiritually minded, which is life and peace and obtaining the resurrection. Okay, just because you've been baptized, in Jesus' name, just because you might speak with other tongues, doesn't mean that you can't get into your carnal mind and, and have a mind full of death and perish in your sins. See, if you think that you stand, you better take heed lest you fall. Carnal means after the flesh. And if we walk after the flesh, we shall die. But if we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, then we shall live. Hallelujah. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Come on now. Were you baptized in the name of the Baptist Church? Did the Baptist Church die for you? Were you baptized in the name of the Apostolic Church? Did the Apostolic Church die for you? Is the Apostolic Church your Savior? If it is, and if there was such a thing as luck, I would wish you lots of it, because the Apostolic Church can't save you, my friend. The Baptist Church can't save you, my friend. Only Jesus Christ can save you. You see? Paul can't save you. Apollos can't save you. Cephas cannot save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. There are no divisions in Jesus Christ's church. If you're divided, then you're divided from Jesus Christ. I thank God that, Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. See, and what a ridiculous thing that anyone should say that Paul baptized in his own name. Why is he speaking such ridiculous things? Because the people at Corinth were speaking such ridiculous nonsense. They were dividing into denominations. They were denominating themselves. Why, if Jesus Christ has given you his name, so that you're called by the name of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you see, even as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. If you're called, or you have the opportunity to be called by the family name, then why would you denominate yourself, choose a lesser name, and be called by the name of Paul, by the name of Apollos, by the name of the Baptists, by the name of the Lutherans, by the name of the Evangelicals, by the name of the uh, whatever denomination you want to make up? Why would you denominate yourself, reject the name of Jesus Christ, and take a lesser name? That's stupid. That's just stupid. Obviously, you would want to be called by the name of Jesus Christ. Why would you take any other name? Jesus Christ is a name above all names, period. There is no name that is equal to his name. And there is no other Savior besides him. But he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I, was excuse me, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus, Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Right? Now, was Paul saying that he never baptized anybody? No, he wasn't. Pay attention. Are you paying attention? He did baptize some people. But he, what he's saying here is that he thanks God that he only baptized a few people and that the other apostles baptized much more for this reason. He says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, Boys and girls, brothers and sisters, there are, <coughs> pardon me, there are a lot of people who get really confused about this verse of the scripture, and they, because of their denominational teachings, because they haven't searched the scriptures, but they have just received the teachings of their denominations, which take a verse of scripture here and there, and then they make up a story. They imagine that baptism is not for the remission of sins, even though the Bible says that it's for the remission of sins. They imagine that baptism doesn't save you, even though the Bible says that baptism saves us. 
They imagine that Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, did not preach baptism for the remission of sins, that he didn't baptize anybody, and that we're not supposed to get baptized, and that has nothing to do with our salvation, and that we can just get baptized after we're saved as, a, as an outward show of inward change. Active obedience after salvation, they call it, which things are not written in the scripture or referred to anywhere in the scripture. And the reason that they do this is because they believe that when Paul said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, they don't read any other of the scripture. They just highlight this little, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words, for Christ sent me not to baptize, and they make a doctrine out of that, totally ignoring the rest of the scripture, and they imagine that because of this sentence, for Christ sent me not to baptize, or because of this part of the sentence, that Paul, the apostle of Christ, was saying that Jesus Christ told him not to baptize anyone. And that, of course, is ridiculous. It's just as ridiculous as those that were in the church at Corinth saying, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. Well, Christ is not divided and Paul was not crucified for anyone and no one was, bapt no one was baptized in the name of Paul. So it's pretty ridiculous for anyone to be saying, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But for this sentence, for Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel, Paul was not in any wise saying that Jesus Christ did not tell him to baptize anyone. What he was saying was that he was thankful that he didn't baptize too many people lest anyone should have occasion in their foolishness to accuse anyone of, of, of or to accuse Paul of having baptized anyone in his own name. And he says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. All right? Jesus Christ didn't send Paul to be a great famous Baptist. He sent Paul to preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel includes baptizing people, of course, in the name of Jesus Christ, because that's how we are saved. But Paul didn't say, Jesus Christ told me not to baptize anyone. He said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You see, now he's appealing to their intellect. He's talking to them as carnal, and this is what he's about to say to them in the third chapter, which we'll get into in a little while. But because these people were carnal, how could they not be carnal if they're, if they're speaking such foolishness, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I am of Christ? Really, they're, they're just not hearing what they're saying if they're saying such stupid things. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the God. Now let's read verses 14 through 16 again so we'll understand it. Verse 14 through 17 so we'll understand it. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus, the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You see, Paul didn't baptize every one of them that was in Corinth. There were others that baptized many of them that were in Corinth. I don't know how many there were, but Jesus Christ said to Paul, I have much people in this place. In the 18th chapter of, of Acts. And so, Paul was saying to them, look, it doesn't matter whether I baptized you or whether Apollos baptized you or whether Cephas baptized you. We baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, not in our own names. We were not sent to baptize anyone in our own name or, or to make disciples unto ourselves. We were sent to preach Jesus Christ and to teach you all to be disciples of Jesus Christ, not of us. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Oh boy, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of, effect, should be made of none effect. The wisdom of words is referring to what people call theology. And through the nonsense of theology, the cross of Christ is made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Why is the preaching of why is the preaching of the cross foolishness to them that perish? Because they cannot hear the word of God. The, the, those that perish, those that cannot hear the word of God, they will say unto you, well, that's foolishness. How, could, how am I supposed to believe that some man who, who got nailed to a cross has anything to do with me or that, that that can save me from anything? And what do I have to be saved from anyway? I'm fine. 
I look at my own life. I'm, I'm the judge of my own life, and I'm fine. I don't, I don't, I've never killed anybody. I don't steal from people unless I absolutely need to. I don't lie unless I absolutely have to. You know, I'm nice to people. I give to the poor every once in a while. So how is a man dying on a cross going to save me, and what do I need to be saved from? I'm fine. I have my relationship with God. I talk to him every day. You see, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. You see, the instruction of Elisha the prophet unto Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5 seemed to him to be foolishness. Who dipped myself in the Jordan River? Well, that's ridiculous. And he started to march off in a huff, off back to his own country, Syria. But when he was persuaded by his servants to obey the word of God that was spoken by Elisha the prophet, then he found out that it wasn't really foolishness, it was actually power. Because what do you need if you're a leper in order to cleanse you from your leprosy? You don't need wisdom of words. You need power. Power! And that's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. It's power. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Hallelujah. For it is written, and this is why Jesus said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. This is written in the scripture, in Job, and Isaiah, and Jeremiah. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Yes, of course. If you know Jesus Christ, then you know the answer to this question is yes, of course. But if the preaching of the cross is foolishness unto you, then you don't understand this. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now listen to this, what Paul's about to say. And this is one of my favorite verses in the whole of Scripture. It is so profound and so powerful. For, and remember what the word for is referring to, it's referring to what was just spoken. It's like therefore, okay? For, or because of this, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believed. 1 Corinthians 1.21. Now let's look at that. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The wisdom of God and the wisdom of men are two different things, aren't they? For the wisdom of men is foolishness with God. The wisdom of the theologians, the wisdom of the papacy, the wisdom of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church and her Protestant daughters, the wisdom of the seminarians, the wisdom of the theological folk who imagine themselves to be well-versed in the Scripture and versed in, in Greek and Hebrew, but cannot hear the word of the living God. Their fathers were the Pharisees, and they said of Jesus, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? And Jesus said, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. You see, if you do the will of God, then you will know of the doctrine. If you try to study your way into the kingdom of God by the works of men, by the religious works and writings of men, then you will never enter the kingdom of God. You will never know God through theology. I don't care who you are. It makes no difference who you are on the other side of this camera. I say this without apology and with no reservation. You will never come to know God through theology. Never. It's not possible. It's not going to happen ever in the entire universe and in the entire realm of all time and eternity. It's not going to happen. You will never know God through theology. Now look at this. For after that, in the wisdom of God, okay, the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, what wisdom is this talking about? The wisdom of men. You see, the world by its own wisdom. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Okay? In the wisdom of God, God is all-knowing. God is the, he's the only wise God. His wisdom is, is as far above us as the heavens are above the earth, my friend. And after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. You see, the world in its wisdom, which is actually foolishness with God, the world by its wisdom decided not to know God. 
they decided that there is no God, or they decided to make up another God, a God that conforms to their own desires, you see. But after their wisdom, they know not God, because they've invented gods. They've invented, uh, or, or the fact that, or, or the notion that there is no God. They invent things with their theology, with their philosophy. This is why Paul said, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You see, so after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, because God in his wisdom knew that the world would invent their own thing called wisdom, which is actually foolishness, and that they would deny him and fail to know him because of their own manufactured wisdom, which is not the wisdom of God. Are you understanding this? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So God in his wisdom, knowing that men would create their own form of wisdom, which is actually foolishness, because when, God, when men leave off to receive the wisdom from God that cometh only from God, and they imagine that they are wise, they become fools. And that which they imagine to be wisdom is actually foolishness. You see, and so because the men of this world have rejected the wisdom of God and invented their own thing that they call wisdom, which is actually foolishness, they have failed to know God. And because God knew this, then it pleased him by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Because the men of this world have invented their philosophies that they refer to as wisdom, it pleased God to go underneath the so-called wisdom of men by preaching something that, or by sending his ministers to preach something that to these men sounds so foolish that they will never believe it, so that those who believe would be saved. You see, if you exalt yourself, you will be abased. And if you humble yourself, you will be exalted. Because God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but giveth grace unto the lowly. You see? And so it pleased God, because of God's mighty wisdom, to have his ministers preach something that sounds so foolish to the men of this world who profess themselves to be wise, but they've rejected the wisdom of God to save them that believe that which the wise men of this world consider to be foolishness. And so Jesus said to the people of his generation, to the Jews of his generation who rejected his word, that you shall be cast out, but people shall come in from the east and the west and the north and the south to sit down in the kingdom of God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you yourselves shall be thrust out. Why would they be thrust out? Because they rejected the word of God. And they were nothing but lost, confused theologians. They refused the wisdom of God, and they manuf manufactured their own wisdom, which in their eyes was wisdom, but in God's eyes is foolishness. And because of that, Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom to the poor, to the meek, to the lowly. And he said to the Pharisees, the harlots and the publicans are going to enter into the kingdom of God before you. What do you think of that? Blessed be the name of the Lord. For that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Hallelujah. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Right? This is what Paul said, and he knew it, because he was a Jew, and he knew the Jews. And isn't it true that the Jews said to Jesus, all throughout the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, show us a sign. And Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Because every sign that they were looking for from the scripture was manifest right in front of them, but they refused to see all of that. It's like a very unfortunately depraved man that I was speaking with recently. Um, he professes himself to be very wise in this world, and he was saying to me that there is no uh, evidence, there is no historical evidence that Jesus Christ ever lived. But yet, he denies the 66 historical letters that are in this book, which are evidence of the fact that Jesus Christ lived. He denies the historical evidence of just about every dictionary that's ever existed. Well, if you, which, if you look up the name Jesus Christ, you'll see 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you know, was born and lived in, in Galilee and did miracles and died for the sins of the world, was crucified and ascended into heaven. He denies all that <clears throat> and then says that there is no historical evidence for the existence of Jesus Christ. Well, <laughs> it's because they deny the truth. They, they, they reject the wisdom of God and invent their own philosophies, rejecting the truth of the Word of God and imagining that it doesn't exist. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Don't hear that. I just want to make up this. You see? And they make up this foolishness, which they imagine to be wisdom. And God in His wisdom looks upon that and says, that's foolishness. <clears throat> and so because that's foolishness, and they imagine it to be wisdom, I'm going to send something in their midst, which is so simple and pure and wise, but will be hidden from them and will seem to them to be foolishness, so that I can call unto myself, those that have ears to hear and who can truly become wise. You see, blessed be the name of the Lord. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Right? I think it's in Acts 17, 24, 17 something or other. 17, 21. It says, For the, all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. The Athenians, well, Athens is, is the city of Greece, of course. And so this is the Greeks. And, and this is why Paul said, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Listen to this again, Acts 17, 21. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And that's why they were began. That's why they began to be interested in what Paul was preaching because it was new, something they had that they had never heard of before, and that's what they were all into in Greece. They were all into trying to learn some new philosophy or some new thing. It didn't matter if it was true or not. It just it was interesting to them because it was new. You see, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. That's what it says, but not the wisdom of God, the wisdom of men, like the theologians. You see, and they imagine precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Why? That they might be wise and inherit the kingdom of God? No, that they might fall and be broken and be snared and taken. This is what the scripture says in Isaiah 28, 13. Okay? Here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. That's what theology will do for you. Okay? And it says, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. You see, but there are two different kinds of wisdom. Look at verse 21 again. There's the wisdom of God, and there's the wisdom of men. The wisdom of God is wise. The wisdom of men is foolishness. You see? For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But we preach Christ crucified. Christ crucified, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, crucified on a wooden cross, nailed to a cross, murdered. You see, and to us, that is the power of God and salvation because we understand why God did this and how it applies to us. But to the Jews, it is a stumbling block. See, because the Bible says that he was crucified in weakness and raised in power. And to the Jews, they were not the, the Jews were not expecting a Messiah to come and die for them. The Jews were expecting a Messiah to be, you know, to go into a phone booth and put on a Superman outfit and, and take over the entire world and give it to them. In their pride. You see, the same Jews that said, as it's written in the book of Ezekiel, Abraham was one and he inherited the land. We are many, the land is ours for possession. And God said unto them, Ah, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. You are full of, your hands are full of blood. You commit adultery. You murder and steal and kill and lie, and you think that you're going to inherit the land? No, it doesn't work that way, you see? And so Jesus Christ didn't come in the manner that the wicked among Israel imagined that he would come. And the wicked among Israel today, the Jewish people today, are still they still reject the fact that Messiah has already come. And they're still waiting for a different Messiah because they don't want Messiah to be what he actually is. They want Messiah to be something else. See, they want to continue to live in their sins, live in their pride, their rebellion, their wickedness, their stiff-necked attitudes, rejecting the word of God but professing to be the people of God. And they want a Messiah to come who will 
not reprove them of their sins, but who will just destroy everybody else in the entire world and set up a kingdom so that they can live in it, in their pride, in their sinfulness, in their rebellion. That's what the Jews wanted then. That's what, that's what the Jews want today. And for that reason, Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to them. You see? And to the Greeks, foolishness. And to the Greeks, foolishness. Why? Well, that sounds foolish. That, like I explained earlier, that sounds foolish to someone who is perishing that a man dying on a cross could save me. And what do I need to be saved from? I'm fine. I'm a nice guy. I give to the poor sometimes, you know, especially on Christmas and Easter. I go to church. You know, I give to the poor. I have never killed anybody in my life. Hopefully I'll never have to. You know, I don't steal from anybody unless I absolutely need to, to, to live. I don't lie unless I absolutely need to, to cover up something. You know, I, I'm fine. I don't need to be saved from anything. So, I, well, it sounds foolish to me that, that a man dying on a cross could save me. And even if I needed to be saved, how's that going to save me? That doesn't make any sense. To the Greeks, that's what they say. You know, the Greeks are everybody in the world who, who, is, who, who, who just loves to hear philosophies and gossip and every new thing. And they love to learn all these new things from men and philosophies and, and the rudiments of the world, but they will not hear the word of God. They reject the wisdom of God and embrace rather that foolishness which men call wisdom. Philosophy, psychology, psychiatry, see? And all the new age philosophies that have... That have uh, been brought into the world by the fallen ones that cause men to, to worship themselves and what they're actually worshiping as devils. There are things like yoga and astrology and seances and worshiping of other spirits that are not God and all these things. You see, to the Greeks, that's wisdom. But to God, that is foolishness. You see? And so the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, because there's only two kinds of natural people in the world, the Jews and the Greeks. The Greeks refers to everyone, everyone that is not a Jew. Okay? But it's not, it doesn't, the Greeks, the word Greeks doesn't only refer to people that live in Greece in some circumstances in the Bible. Some, in some places it refers to Gentiles. It's the same as the same, it's the same as saying the Gentiles. You see? But to them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now listen to me. Are you paying attention? Am I still retaining your attention? Look at me. Jesus Christ crucified is the power of God and the wisdom of God. He was crucified in weakness but raised in glory. How is it that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being crucified on a cross could be power? It doesn't take any power to let men nail you to a cross and die, one might say. Uh, yes, it does. If you're an innocent man, it takes power to not do anything to try to defend yourself, to know that your Father has sent you unto this hour, and to receive humbly the torture and death that was meant for a criminal when you have done no evil. And to know that you are going to be raised from the dead, to know the joy that is set before you, as it's written of Jesus in the scripture, and that you are going to be raised from the dead, you embrace the suffering of the cross. You see, there's only one man in the history of the universe who did that and never could do that, and that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that's why he is my hero, you see. He could have called for a legion of angels to, to take him off of that cross and destroy all the men around him. He could have done so. Don't you remember when he was in the garden and they, and, and they came to get him, the guards? And he, and he said to them, who, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And when he said, I am he, the power of him speaking those three words, I am he, or even those two words, I am, because the word he is in italics. When he spoke his name, when he said I am, what happened? All those guards, they fell down to the ground. They were covered with armor and had weapons, torches and spears and swords and shields. And he spoke two words, and they all fell to the ground. Do you not think that that same Jesus could have delivered himself from the cross, destroyed all those people, and caused them to set up a throne for him and sat on his throne and ruled as a king? Yes, of course he could have. But what he did was even more powerful than that. He gave himself to be crucified for you and me, knowing that he would be raised again and we will be able to inherit life through his name so that when he does come and establish his throne in the earth, which he will do, 
that we might be able to be with him because of his mercy and grace. And it was his power that did that. There is nothing in this universe more powerful than what Jesus Christ did when he gave himself to be crucified as the Lamb of God and to be risen from the dead. There is nothing more powerful than that. That is the center of all creation. That is the center of the plan of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word was the plan that from the very beginning was centered around the fact that God himself would come in the flesh and allow his son to be crucified and be raised from the dead. That is the most powerful thing that has ever been done. That is more powerful than God creating the heavens and the earth with his word. It is more powerful than God saying, let there be light, and there was light. More powerful than God saying, let there be light, and there was light, was the act that God did to redeem men from the darkness into the light so that we could be sons of the light and partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That is power. That is the most powerful thing that ever happened. And that power is working in you and in me, according to what Paul the Apostle wrote in the book of Ephesians. Let me just read that for you. I have to. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, Hallelujah. And what is, I'm reading uh, from verse uh, 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all, and you, and you hath he quickened, and you. Now look at in verse 20, which he wrought in Christ. Now look at in verse chapter 2, verse 1, and you. Again, which he wrought in Christ, verse 20. Ephesians 1, 20, which he wrought in Christ. Which he wrought in Christ. His mighty power, which he wrought in Christ. Chapter 2, verse 1, and you. And you. This mighty power that God wrought in Christ, raising him up from the dead because he gave himself to be crucified, this power was wrought in Jesus Christ and in you. And the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> this power, this mighty powerful thing, the most powerful thing that has ever occurred in the history of the universe, did not occur only in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. It has occurred in you and in me. And this is why God said, I am as the ocean and my people live in a teaspoon. Because we don't realize we don't realize the mighty power that God hath wrought in us, that mighty power that God hath wrought to usward, that we are raised up together and seated together in Christ Jesus in heavenly places, that mighty power that God wrought in Jesus Christ when he gave himself to be crucified for our sins and raised him from the dead, that power is not only wrought in him, that power is wrought in you. And if it's not in you, then you're not a Christian. If it's not in you, then how are you going to inherit the resurrection? How are you going to, to, to get up from the dead like Jesus got up from the dead after this body dies? How are you going to achieve, how are you going to attain the resurrection if the resurrection isn't already in you? If you have the first fruits of the Spirit in you, if you have the first fruits of the resurrection in you, then whatever happens to cause your body to die doesn't matter because you are part of the resurrection. You have eternal life living in you. And if your body dies, then you will be raised from the dead. This is why Jesus said, He that believeth, he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Jesus wasn't saying that you shall never experience physical death. What he's saying is if you live and you believe in him, then you shall never die. Because when this body dies, you shall be raised from the dead. And if you have the first fruits of the resurrection in you, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of your Father in you, then you have the earnest of your inheritance. You have the first fruits of the resurrection, and you will be raised from the dead, even as Christ was raised from the dead. And so you don't have to fear death, even as Christ didn't fear death. And that is power, my friend. And this is why Jesus said, Whosoever will, will be my disciple, let him deny himself daily and take up his cross and follow me. 
How do you get raised from the dead? By dying. If you don't die, you can't be raised from the dead. If you're afraid of death, then you can't be Jesus' disciple. This is power. This is power. There is only one way out of this life alive, and that is to be in Jesus Christ, to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. The only way to the resurrection is the cross. That's the only way. There is no other way to the resurrection. You have to die in order to be raised from the dead. And if you have the spirit of the resurrection in you, the spirit of the risen one, the risen Christ, then that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Oh, where were we? Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The power of God, we've looked at that. The wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. The preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ seems like foolishness to the Greeks, to the Gentiles who have their theology all worked out, who have their, 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 their things all worked out. It is foolishness to them. Okay. Yes, theologians will tell you they believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, and they can probably explain to you a million reasons why they believe that Jesus Christ was crucified. But they don't understand. They don't hear the word of God. If they did, they would obey the gospel and be saved, but they won't obey the gospel. They believe that baptism doesn't save you. They believe that God is a trinity of persons. They believe that, that they automatically have the Holy Ghost because they've accepted Jesus Christ into their heart, and none of that is true. It's all based on lies. That has nothing to do with the scripture. You see? But they all think that they can explain to you the reason that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, but they don't know because they're not crucified unto the world, and neither is the world crucified unto them. They are of the world, and therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. But we are of God, little children, we are of God. And he that knoweth God heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. And hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The wisdom of God is that which is considered to be foolishness by men who consider themselves to be wise in their own estimation. You see, Jesus Christ didn't come to call the wise men of this world. And Paul's going to talk about that in a little bit. He came to call the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And through the foolishness of preaching, it pleased God to save them that believe in the midst of a world full of people who imagine that they are wise and have rejected the wisdom of God. And so Paul says, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm trembling because of the power of the anointing in me that is speaking these things to you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 25, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Now, if God peradventure had foolishness in himself, which he doesn't, but this is to compare how foolish men are, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. Men who reject the wisdom of God can study all they want for years and decades and generations, and all the wisdom that they may attain unto is not even as wise as the foolishness of God. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. If peradventure God had a weakness, which he doesn't, all the power, all the power that men all over this world could amass unto themselves is not worthy to be compared to the weakest possible point that the Almighty God could ever have. Period. Verse 26, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Do we see that, brothers and sisters? Yes, we do. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What are most of us, if not all of us? We are not great wise men and women of this world. We are not men and women of great stature, kings, presidents, princes, nobles of this world, mighty men of this world, rich men of this world. No. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world. Now, let's, let's, look, let's, look, let's look at that again. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, Paul wasn't saying that it's not possible for any of those people to be called. 
Uh, he's just saying that it's not very likely. And I don't know of anybody in that situation who is. I don't know of anybody of, of the, the so-called great men of this world, of the global elite, so to speak, who are called of God. There's none of them that I've ever heard of. It's not to say that it's not impossible for any of them to change their ways, and that's why God has called us to pray for them. But I've never heard of one. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen, what, the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God hath sent forth, in his wisdom, he hath sent forth, hidden in broad daylight, that which is great wisdom, but seems to be foolishness to the wise men of this world, to reach the hearts of those who will receive the wisdom of God, and to exalt those of us who have been considered the foolish things of this world above the wise, to confound the wise. Hallelujah. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. What power hath all the armies of this world to take the weakest Christian out of the hands of the living God? The weakest little old widow who barely has a shack to live in, who might even have two pennies to her name, but she is born of water and of the Spirit, she is a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. What power is there in this earth? What multitude of armies could ever hope to attain to the, to the level of power that would be necessary to pull that little widow out of the hand of Jesus Christ? They have no power. In all of their nuclear weapons and their tanks and their ships and their planes and their commanders and their brigadier generals with all the pentagrams on their outfits, and all their organizations, and all their laws that they might pass, they are completely and utterly powerless to pull even that little, weak widow out of the hand of Jesus Christ. To pull her out of the kingdom of God, they have no power. None. There is nothing that they could do. There is nothing that they could ever formulate. There is no weapon that they could form against her that will prosper. Hallelujah. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. And even if all the armies of the world gathered together and they decided to bomb the house of that little widow and blow her body into bits, and if the birds came and ate up those little bits, and then the birds fell down from the sky because of the chemtrails and were fell into the ocean and were eaten by fish, and then those fish were eaten by other fish, and those fish were eaten by other fish, and then those fish were fished out of the sea and eaten by Eskimos, and those Eskimos were blown up in a nuclear blast in a world war, and their bits get, went into the atmosphere and absorbed into the clouds, and those clouds rained that rain over another country, and the toads in that country drank up the rain, and, and, and so on and so forth. That little widow is going to be raised from the dead, incorruptible, in Christ Jesus, because the mighty power that God hath wrought in His Son Christ Jesus, He hath also wrought in those of us who belong to Him. And that mighty, that little widow is going to sit on a throne in glory, in the presence of Jesus Christ, and she is going to be judged over those people that put that bomb over her house. Those people that dropped a bomb on her house will bow before her and will be made to know that Jesus Christ hath loved her and that they will be utterly defeated forever and ever. And in the fire, they will be roasted in the smoke of their torment shall ascend forever and ever. And they will know in the fire forever and ever and ever that that little widow was more powerful than they all because she had a covenant with Jesus Christ. Because the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us it is the power of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Hallelujah. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. The Pharisees and theologians in hell, rotting and burning forever and ever, will forever curse the simple wisdom that was given to us, the children of the living God, when we spoke the word of God to them, and they refused it and desired to debate <laughs> and argue. 
and debate over philosophy and theology and, 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 and predestination and, and, and grace and, and all, all the things that they misunderstand and, and want to talk about dispensationalism and hermeneutics and all their foolishness. They just wanted to argue about that. They rejected the word of God and they will rot in the fire for eternity, burning for eternity. The smoke of their torment shall ascend forever and ever. Never, ever, ever will they have a second of rest or a drop of water or a bite to eat or, or a chance to lay down or a peace and quiet for even one second for all eternity. And they will forever curse the day when they conversed with you or me, children of the living God, who gave them the word of the living God, and they refused it, and we rejected them as we are commanded. Didn't want to argue with them. We just walked on our way and did what we were called to do. Because, my brethren, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Forever in the fire they shall be confounded, and gnashing their teeth, gnash, biting their tongues, and, 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 and cursing the day that they spoke with us and could have received the truth of God's word but refused. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Why? Why hath God ordained all this? That no flesh should glory in his presence. When, this, that, when these things happen, I have described to you, when that little widow and you and me are in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and those who exerted their physical power over us to kill us, or those who exerted their supposed wisdom against us to try to confound us, they shall be confounded, and they shall be destroyed forever and ever and ever. And unto whose glory will that be? Unto yours, mine, that little widow? No. Because the power was not yours or mine or of that little widow. The power was of the Almighty God, which was being exercised through us because it pleased God by the preaching of foolishness to save them that believe. So that no flesh should glory in his presence. The flesh, those men, those wicked who refused the wisdom of God, who refused the power of God, imagining that they had their own wisdom and their own power, they will never be able to glory in the presence of God. And those of us who received the wisdom and the power of God so that his power and wisdom is working and will have worked through us, we shall never be able to glory in, the, in, in God's presence, except in him, but not in ourselves. God has ordained this whole thing as he has ordained it so that he alone will be glorified so that he alone will be exalted on his throne and glorified among the righteous and among the wicked for God hath made all things for himself yea even the wicked for the day of evil God will be glorified in the destruction of the wicked God will be glorified in the salvation of the righteous God will be glorified in the recompense that he will see fit to do upon the wicked who have persecuted the righteous God will be glorified. God alone will be glorified. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But it says in verse 30, But of him, but of God, but of him, are ye in Christ Jesus. You and me, brothers, those of you who are in Christ Jesus, this is speaking to you. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus Christ is made by God unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Let's look at these four words. Wisdom, okay, not the wisdom of men, the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God that is given to those that are humble. You see, if any man be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise, as it's written in the scripture. In other words, if you think yourself to be wise, then you should humble yourself and receive the wisdom that cometh only from God, and then you will be wise. But if you will not humble yourself and you consider yourself to be wise, then you are a fool. Wisdom. Jesus Christ has made unto us wisdom. He is the way and the truth and the life. If we abide in his word and his word in us, then it shall be well with us. You see, and we shall ask what we will, and it shall be done unto us. And we shall walk in wisdom and manifest the wisdom of God unto the people of this world. And most of them will perceive that wisdom as foolishness. That's between them and God. You see, wisdom is justified of all her children. Wisdom is not justified by the sons of men. 
wisdom is justified by all her children. And so wisdom and righteousness, righteousness, what is righteousness? Righteousness is not a pretend state of being that you imagine that you have because your pastor told you that because you accepted Jesus Christ, now you're righteous. No, that's ridiculous. Righteousness is the act of doing that which is right, the act of speaking that which is right, the act of eschewing that which is evil, you see? The act of not doing that which is wrong and doing that which is right. That is righteousness. That is the definition of righteousness. You see, and Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory, is righteousness. He has made unto us righteousness. Because if you have the spirit of Jesus Christ in you, then you are able to fulfill the righteousness of the law because you walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What spirit? The spirit of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is in you and you're obeying him, then you're going to walk as he walked. You see, <clears throat> he that saith, I know him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked, saith the scripture. And so if Jesus Christ is in you, then he has made unto you righteousness, wisdom and righteousness, and sanctification. What is sanctification? We talked about that a little bit earlier in the first part of the study. Sanctification is when you have been taken out of the world and you are cleaned up by God so that you are able to serve him and meet to serve him in his kingdom. And that means that you no longer will go back to the filth that he washed you from, but you have the responsibility to keep yourself clean in his sight so that he can, pardon me, so that he can continue to use you in his kingdom. That's what sanctification is. It means, that it's, it's, it means the same thing as holiness. Sanctification and holiness are two synonymous terms. They mean the same thing. It means when you have been taken out of the filth, out of the darkness, cleansed from the filth and the darkness, so that you are fit to serve God in the way that he is worthy and demands to be served. That's what sanctification is. And Jesus Christ has made unto us sanctification. Why? Because he was sanctified. He sanctified himself unto the Father and then sanctified himself by being baptized into death so that we who are in him could be sanctified in him and by him, you see, by abiding in his word. So as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was sanctified and sanctified himself unto the Father, so we sanctify ourselves unto the Father by abiding in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has made unto us sanctification. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Redemption. What does redemption mean? Redeem. Redeem means when something that is trapped is purchased out of that trap so that it is free. Okay? If a person is sold into slavery and somebody else comes and says, okay, I'll give, you you know, you're the master of the slave. How much do you want for the slave? $50. Okay, I'll give you $50. Now give me the slave. Now the slave is free. That's redemption. Okay? When someone who is able to pay the price or someone who has the power comes and rescues someone else who has been in bondage, that's redemption. And we, you and me, well, it doesn't matter who you are anywhere in the world, even if you're not a Christian, you were born in sin. We were born slaves to sin because of Adam's transgression. We were born sinners. See, when we were formed in the womb, when, when we were conceived in the womb and two cells became one and started to grow into a human body, we were sinners. We were born under that curse. And the only way for us to not be sinners anymore is to be redeemed, to be bought from the slavery to sin and redeemed and brought into the, the, the marvelous light of the Almighty God so that we become no longer sinners but saints. And that's what Jesus Christ is to us. He's the Lamb of God, and by his blood, he purchased us because the life of the flesh is in the blood. You see, Leviticus 17, 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Therefore have I given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. The price had to be paid, and the price was blood, because the wages of sin is death, and the life of the flesh is in the blood. And if the blood runs out of your body, guess what? You die, because the life of your flesh is your blood. See, if you don't have any blood left in your body, you will die. See, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Do you understand? And when the blood is drained out of the body, the body will die. And so the blood was given, the righteous, precious blood of the Lamb of God. And that is the price of redemption. And so whoever you are in the whole world, even if you're not a Christian, you're watching this video, the price has been paid for your redemption. You don't have to live as a sinner anymore. 
You can live as a saint. The price has been paid for your redemption. Do you understand? This is not a religious parable. This is not a myth. It is a fact, a historical fact. The Son of God, whose father was God and whose mother was a woman, who had no human father, was sent into the world for the specific purpose of being murdered for you. His blood was poured out on Calvary, on a cross, for you. His blood was poured out of his body until he died, and then he was raised from the dead. Why was he raised from the dead? Because he was innocent when he died, and death couldn't hold him, because death was made for the wicked. And he is the forerunner, the first fruits of them that slept. And the price has been paid, and if you will believe the gospel that was preached by the apostles of Jesus Christ, and is preached by me and others who believe in the doctrine of Jesus Christ, and if you will repent from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory, then you will have been redeemed. This is not a religious myth. It is a fact. It is just as real as if you put something in, in hock, and I went down to the pawn shop and paid the money and got the receipt and got the thing and brought it back to you. It is just as real as that, my friend. Every bit is real. Jesus Christ paid the price for your sins and mine. And if you will obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the doctrines of the denominations, the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is written and preserved in this word, as the apostles of Jesus Christ preached it, then God will save you. He will give you the first fruits of the resurrection. You will no longer fear death. You will have the wisdom that cometh from God that the men of this world consider to be foolishness. You will have the strength from God that the men of this world consider to be weakness. And you will have an inheritance in the kingdom of God which the men of this world consider to be fantasy. You will have it. It is real. Blessed be the name of the Lord, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Hallelujah. To the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, King of kings, be all glory and honor and power and praise and might and majesty and dominion forever and ever and ever. To him it is, to him it has always pertained, and to him it will be forever. Hallelujah. I had such a blessed time sharing this with you, and this is just the first chapter of this wonderful letter called 1 Corinthians. May the Lord bless you and let these things sink deep into your heart, cause you to, to understand the revelation of these things more and more as you seek him in his word. And I look forward, God willing, to sharing with you the rest of this blessed letter as God allows me the time. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may God bless you as you continue in his word and in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.